everyone, welcome back to another episode of Chanel in the City. I'm your host, Chanel Omari, and I have a very special guest in the building today. She's the talented author of one of my favorite books out right now, By Yourself, The Fucking Lilies. And she's the executive in charge of one of my favorite comedy shows on Comedy Central, Lights Out with David Spade. Please welcome my girl, my friend, my guest, Tara Schuster to the building. Hello. How are you? Good, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for having me, this is an honor. <laughs> thank you. Because I'm a big, I'm fangirling out right now because I'm a big fan of yours and your mm. whole career. Thank you. Thank and you. I wanna talk first and foremost about your book which is hilarious, relatable, it gives us all these feels. Talk to us about what inspired you behind Buy Yourself the Fucking Lilies, and I love that title. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, so I never set out even to write a book. Okay. I set out to save my life. Right. That was sort of the impetus. So I grew up in a neglectful household where things came to die, like all of the plants, all of the pets, like Iggy the iguana was a goner because we didn't know how much to feed an iguana. You had an iguana too, so did I. I can yeah. relate a lot, by the way, because I, when you say neglect, a household with neglect, I, I can relate. I yeah. feel the same way. A lot of us, I think, go through it, but we don't want to admit it out loud. Yeah, it, it has been interesting to talk about because people kind of, once I say it, Often the response is, I felt that too, but I felt like I shouldn't feel that way. Or we're shocked because I see you're so, you're, you're a very put together person and right. you have it all together. Right. Or how we feel it seems. I present so shonky, shonky. as normal. Um, but then it's like, well, none of us are normal. Right. But um, so I, I grew up in this neglectful household. And by the time I was 25, I was just a mess wreck disaster of a person. I, I had a permanent headache. I lived inside of an anxiety attack. You know, on a good day, you'd find me openly weeping in the subway, um, or like the random girl on your stoop just who's lost her shit and <laughs> crying like that was me on many occasions. And I finally hit rock bottom um, when I was 25. I drunk dialed my therapist and threatened to hurt myself. And oh, wow. that was my rock bottom moment. Um, and the next morning, listening to voicemails from my therapist, I heard the worry in her voice. And that made me really worried because she was like a really calm European woman who was always drinking a cup of tea. Right. But here she was like freaking out about like, I need to go to a hospital. So I was like, oh, what the fuck? Like, this is not a thing. This is not a look. I need a way forward but I don't even know how to change a vacuum cleaner filter. Like, how am I gonna do this? Right. And I also felt like a fraud because I felt like I shouldn't feel this bad. Like I didn't have the worst childhood ever. You know, I knew that other people had it much worse and, and things on the surface even looked pretty good. I had always gone to good schools where I'd gotten good grades. Right. I had a good job. Right. Everything on the surface looked pretty good. So I felt like I shouldn't feel this way. But that next morning, I realized it didn't really matter if I should or shouldn't feel this way. Like I had to put should off the table because I knew how I felt. I felt miserable. I hated myself. I was exhausted in my guts and I wanted to change that. I'm so happy, sorry to yeah. interrupt, but I'm so like, happy on that note that, that you're saying that. It's so, like it's yeah. so relatable yeah. Yeah. because, and I want people to hear this because it's the should or shouldn't. Yeah. And that's the thing that we're always like, but I shouldn't feel this way because I, I had it better than most kids. Right. Or I should feel this way because, you, like you said, right. I have a great job according to society. But right. the fact that you're owning, but I'm not okay and that's what matters. Yeah. That's what hit, that hits home. Yeah. Sorry, by the way, I'm a crier. Uh, me too. By so, the way, I've sorry, cried like, at least four times okay. today. today. <laughs> okay, so, so it's healthy to cry. Yeah, it's, it's very we'll healthy to that. cry. Um, yeah, I basically decided I don't give a fuck what I should or shouldn't feel. There's only one thing that's real here. It's how I actually do feel. And that the should was keeping me in a box because I wasn't dealing with myself. Yeah. Um, so that morning I decided I need to deal with my life. And since I'd always been a good student, I decided to approach it like a student. I, I said, what if I built a curriculum for being my own parent? Like, what would that look like? What would it look like to reparent myself? So I opened up a Google document and I started with the most basic questions I had. Like, what are values? 
what are principles, what are vegetables? Like Ooh. genuinely, what are they and which one should I be eating? Because I really did not know. And I attacked it. I attacked it like a ninja of self-love. I was just like, I'm going to fucking get this. Like I had gotten good grades and that kind of thing. And this Google document grew. So over five years, I ended up with 600 pages and a couple different Google Docs, but 600 pages and all of this advice that I had tried on and lessons I had learned. And I was a different person at the end of it. I was stable. I was happy. And I couldn't believe it. And that is when I realized, oh, I have a story to share. I have an offering. I have something that I hope will help other people. So that was, you know, I didn't set out to write a book about self-care. I set out to learn how to take care of myself. And that ended up being a book. Exactly. That's helping others out there. I hope so. Like myself, because I, you know, and I read the book and I love the book. And Thank you. It helps me and other women and men too in, in general yeah. to feel less alone and to feel like if Tara Schuster has it all together but can be vulnerable in this way, then we all can. Yeah, it's you know? funny. I've gotten a lot of comments about... Um, you know, like, I can't believe you're being this honest. Yeah. Which always makes me wonder, is everyone else lying? <laughs> yeah, that's what and I'm like. like are you I, the only honest well, person in the entertainment industry? And, but I'm like, oh, should I be lying? Like, it didn't occur to me to lie. It's, right. It's funny because even colleagues now, they're like, oh, I didn't realize that you had a challenging upbringing because, as you say, like, I present as pretty, like, put together. Yeah. The difference is I own it. I am pretty put together now. But, right. it, but I wouldn't be here had I not gone back and done all of this work to get here. And I'm just not ashamed of myself. I think like that's I also, love that. I just... Because you uh, don't yeah. feel like... And, that, and that's the thing too is in the industry we're in. And yeah. also I think because you are VP of development of Comedy Central. You mm -hmm. are an executive in charge, right? And I know mm -hmm. it took a while and we're going to get to that how it what it took for you to get there. But yeah. a lot of the stigma in mental health also, or from what I've learned or grown up around is, well, you're never really going to make it Chanel mm. in this industry mm. if you yeah. don't, if you're mentally not ill, but if you're mentally having challenges or you're not, you're not ignoring them enough. Right. Does that make sense? Well, I think we are living in a mental health crisis. Right. And it's not even I think. It's we are. Mm -hmm. Suicide is way up. Depression and anxiety, way up. Yep. And at Comedy Central, actually, one of our the things that we're working on is to destigmatize mental health issues. Because it's insane. It's like, insane. we don't need to add... If you're already feeling bad and going through a thing, we do not need to add the um, like blame, judgment to like that's like putting like kerosene in a fire. Like there's really right. no reason for it, and we're all suffering to some extent because feeling your feelings is an inherently vulnerable, difficult thing to go through. I just think ignoring things and repressing them, like you think you're doing such a good job, but one of the things I write is that which you do not deal with deals with you always. Hmm, it's, I love that. It's the promise I could make to anyone is if you don't deal with your shit, it will deal with you. It might be subconsciously, you might not always be aware of it, but it is... It is framing your worldview. It is making decisions for you. And so I just decided I'm not ashamed of myself. I'm not ashamed of my background. In fact, I own it. And I want to own my own narrative. I want to make my own choices. And, you know, kind of like, fuck you. Mm -hmm. If my vulnerability, if you see that as something to judge, then we should not work together. I love that. Like, is why, what I love that you're even... <laughs> saying that. Yeah, like if you're going to judge right. me for saying I've been through some shit and I came out on the other side, cool story, bro. <laughs> like let's not work to together get, then. Yeah, and so let's take it back to like when you Yeah. how did you grow up and why why did you feel, I guess, neglected and Yeah. how did all this come about? Cuz I I've I I could relate to and I'm sure a lot of people could relate to where I was told Push your feelings aside. Mm -hmm. People are not going to think you're normal if you cry in front of them mm -hmm. a lot. People are not going to respect you if 
because I come from parents who are, you know, came from other countries and moved right. to America. So I don't know if that's a cultural thing. Right. So talk yeah. to us a little bit about, you know, your upbringing and, and how it affected why you even got into the career you got to. Right. Yeah. So I grew up in a in the right part of town, in the right neighborhood, on the right street. Um, my dad was a busy lawyer and my mom a busy doctor. Um, but that belied the fact that they were like constantly in debt. It was a boom and bust economy of, you know, one moment we're going on a lavish vacation to Hawaii, but a dentist appointment is never guaranteed. And we're definitely not going to the same dentist twice because we are dodging bills. Um, you know, like when I was, you know, some, something like younger than 12, I witnessed my first car repossession. Mm -hmm. It was extreme chaos like financial chaos, emotional chaos, a lot of screaming. Mm -hmm. like, a lot of screaming I raised I was raised around too. Which doesn't get the credit it deserves for being extremely destructive. You know, when I think back to my parents' marriage, it was a fog of war, like much like Vietnam, like for 13 years they're just in it, but why? Right. Nobody knows. <laughs> you know, like why are we doing this? It's a good this? analogy, like, great analogy. <laughs> You know, so that was the environment. It was, you know, and I talk about in the book, there were some darker things, but I think what's relatable to, to most people is that kind of, there was a lot of financial instability, a lot of financial fright, um, a lot of chaos. And my parents, if they were there, they were screaming or they were just absent. So that totally. was, you know, so I never felt like I had a stable anything. And it was always extremes. Like it was always extremes. Everything felt very conditional. Mm -hmm. Like I once went into, a, um, I've been trying to meditate for like 10 years. And I, there was one meditation that I write in the book where they asked me to think of a moment I felt unconditionally loved as a mm -hmm. child. Genuinely could not think of one. Not one where I felt like, I was enough just because I was a human born to my parents. Totally. To so, I'm yeah. like so hearing you right now. Yeah. Is, and, and I'm sure a lot of people too are yeah. hearing you because that is a real thing. Yeah. And it's so it's like, was I getting beaten up on the daily? No. Right. That, that's not an experience that I would claim. Did I feel scared, unsure of my place without value? Yes. That I definitely felt. And so I think the weird superpower it gave me was I tethered all my self-worth to what other people thought, like trying to get validation from adults, basically. Totally. So I did really well in school because that was a place where adults would pay attention to me. In my career, I was always hustling to be like the youngest, the best, get the shiniest title because that would validate me. Totally. And, you know, to some extent it worked. I got to good schools where I got good grades and I got scholarships and I got good jobs. But on the other side of that, you know, around 10 years ago, I realized this is very hollow. Right. It's a I, there's a price to pay. Yeah. If, if my self-worth is tethered to other people's validations, I'm always going to lose. You, you can't totally. win that game. And and that's, I think, the struggle. I feel like you can articulate it so brilliantly because a lot of us are emotional about it. So there's times mm -hmm. I find myself feeling what you are just what you just said, yeah. but I don't know how to articulate it because mm. I feel like I'm going to sound crazy. Again, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from what has been embedded in my head or like spoken what you should. or what I should or yeah. shouldn't, but it's so true yeah. because it, it's... It's it's a true it's a true thing. That's that's why it's good that you're put, bringing it to the surface. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I was telling you before, like the only reason I wrote this book was to make other people feel less lonely. Totally. That's the only intention behind doing it is to say, like, you are not alone. Um, in the same way that memoirs and the books of adults that I was looking to for advice, like Nora Ephron, mm -hmm. Steve Martin, Cheryl Strayed, those memoirs really made me feel less alone so that was the reason to do this book was to try to give back what I had been given yeah totally because I do feel like people don't realize that I've and a lot of people have placed validation on what people think right and especially in this industry for me it's been a handicap to even move forward when mm -hmm. I know I can because of the what you should what you shouldn't mm -hmm. 
your feelings don't matter. I didn't feel unconditionally loved. I felt yeah. conditioned. Right. But I didn't understand what that really meant, honestly, until I read your book. Oh, wow. Which is crazy because I'm 35. I mean, I'm a smart girl and I've, I've, I've there's definitely right. like I'm a deeper than this and I've had thoughts, but I never had them validated until I read your book where oh. it meant like, wow, other people felt conditioned well, as well. Th thank you for sharing yeah. that. I, yeah. I mean, I... This sounds so cheesy, but I mean it. I wrote it for you. Thank you. No, I know. You know I'm, like I don't, I'm gonna cry, but like that's. I felt that way, yeah. and that and that's so incredible for you to admit and still be a woman in the arts and be like, hey, I'm owning this, and I'm still successful, yeah. but I'm finding my worth, and you should find it with me. Yeah, you know? I I hope it's. Um, I uh, was talking to someone about the the book earlier today. And I realized, like, I didn't write any advice on high. I wrote it on low because right. I was in the gutter. In like, I was really not doing well. Um, and I urgently needed things to learn how to take care of myself. And that's where this all comes from. So I, too, have been there. And, you know, to get the language to be able to articulate these things took a lot of work. Like, yeah, it's a lot. It's, it was a it was a lot of work, but that's why to share it because right. I did that work. So maybe it can be helpful. Like maybe I can save people a little bit of trouble by bringing this to light and by not being ashamed by totally. by owning it. Totally. On that note, so we talk yeah. a lot about internal and the external life. Yeah. Can you elaborate about that? And do you did you have a time in your career where you were like, I can't hide this anymore? Meaning, mm. did it affect also promotions or just where you were going in life? How did you yeah. how did you cope with it all, I guess? Yeah, it it never affected my performance at work um, because that was where I was getting any validation whatsoever. So at all costs, I was going to be the best at whatever it was I was doing. Totally. If, even if it was like um, a lowly internship where I'm like cleaning the coffee machine, I'm going to be the best fucking person at cleaning that coffee machine. So it was it was this drive to be better that made it impossible for me to fuck up at work. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I had no sense of self. The internal world was a disaster, like a mess wreck of self-medicating with weed, drinking too much, um, bad decisions with partners, like yep. very unstable internal world. But my external world of achievement, that I had on lock, that I wasn't going to mess with. And you feel like a lot of people that... Do you feel like a lot of people that go through mental health issues in, in that sense, is that the case for a lot of them or everyone's different? I think different? it's everyone's different. I, I do think there's a certain breed of high achiever who is um, really good at work, really bad at living. Mm -hmm. And I am around a lot of them and they're crying in their office and they don't know why. And then they, you know, one day come to, maybe I should go talk to somebody about why I'm chronically in tears and literally don't have the language to talk about it. So I think I think there are just a lot of people suffering. Yeah. <laughs> they're suffering and they're suffering alone and then they say, oh, let me have a bottle of rosé. It'll all be better. It'll all be better. Or like, a joint. Which was my case. I was self-medicating with marijuana. That was my crutch of choice. Was it taboo at the time when you were? Not as... Um, I grew up in California, so it's oh. always been a little bit more um, accepted. accepted. But it became my personality as like I was this stoner girl who was still super smart. Like I could get good grades, but still smoke weed. Like super, yeah, like the reliable, they call them the functional potheads. Yeah, right? like that was me. And that was important to my personality until I realized what a shitty fucking personality that is. <laughs> like, wait, what? My. Right. A substance is a part of how I present myself to the world. And yeah, I was really dependent. And in the book I write about, you know, kind of having um, a moment where I thought, you know, what's more terrifying, never getting to know myself at all or putting down this pipe? And I finally <laughs> decided it was more terrifying to me if I would never meet my emotions because that's what weed was doing. It was just blunting, pushing down, making numb. Mm -hmm. And I, I got sick of it. I just didn't want to be numb anymore. 
I, numb right. wasn't working. If escaping and self-medicating worked, I'd be fucking president. But I was crying on a stoop. Right, so, still, while you yeah. were self-medicating. And that's when you, is that when you realized, okay, now I really have to face it, myself? Yeah, I mean, it was really that drunk dial that was like, drunk dial that said okay, all. I need to investigate all parts of my life. Um, and then when I was living in Manhattan, I realized sort of, that I was using weed if my electrical bill was too high, mm -hmm. if I got broken up with, if I had a cold. Really, if anything happened that was less than ideal, I was like smoking weed. Right. Well, and I realized, okay, that's not a thing. And, you, and you're not alone because a lot yeah. of also my audience had asked me questions like, and I've been through it too, yeah. where I've used drinking or substance to just, I'm going to be okay if I do this, or I'm going to be okay if I just smoke that bowl, or if... And, and At least you're admitting it, though. That's my major warning sign for everybody is if you start to self-justify, if you say, I've had a hard week, I deserve a glass of wine, I got broken up with, I deserve this joint, that should be a giant red flag in your head because we don't justify the healthy things. Mm -hmm. Like, you would never say, I had a tough week, let me breathe oxygen. <laughs> Like you, or let me eat an apple. Let, let me have an apple. Let me have some kale <laughs> or a pizza. Like, well, yeah. Well, so yeah. that's advice, I guess, yeah. too. If we but, eat it too much. But we don't. You're right. We don't justify the healthy things. So the only the only time we use that equation is if it if we know mm -hmm. in our gut, oh, this bottle of Pinot Noir is not going to solve my heartache. I need to justify it somehow. So. I think when we're trying to find, like, many of us have crutches. You know, for some people, it's um, watching, t binge watching TV until they're just like numb on yeah. a night where they wanted to go to bed early. For me, it was weed. For others, Chardonnay. Whatever it is you want to choose. Right. I think one of the ways we can identify that crutch is by asking, "What's the equation I keep making of what I deserve?" Like, I had a tough week. I deserve X. Like. If you hear that enough times, like zero in on that and then maybe have a look-see, like no judgment, no shade, I'm not saying you got a problem, I'm just saying maybe you want to look at this. Right. That's No, that's a good tip for all of us yeah. to, to realize and not get caught up because anything too much is unhealthy for yeah, you. Yeah, and in the book I write, like it's a label-free zone, I'm not trying, I'm definitely right. not trying to take anything away from anybody, I'm just saying... Can you be honest with yourself? Right, because I think that's the first step to healing, right? Yeah. Is us being honest with ourselves. It's yeah. not about judging. No. It's like you can take that joint, but for the right reasons maybe, right? Yeah, or like in moderation. I mean, it's a nuanced thing, and I mm -hmm. think to each their own, and I have no judgments at all. I was abusing marijuana. Right. I you, was straight you, up. For like, yourself. It was yeah. just that's something that you had to like stop and just. That was That is not in the cards for me to ever fuck with again. Right. Um, but I think the first step is identifying what the crutch is. Another good way to do it is what is the thing that your friends tend to tease you about? And I'm not saying your friends are right. Right. But if your friends are saying that your schedule is so packed that you're allergic to friendship or they're congratulating you on like not falling down drunk at a party. Why are they joking about this? Like why has True. this become the joke? Like True, because they're the observers. Yeah, and sometimes it's really hard. If it's hard for, for you to get honest about it, why is everybody saying that I'm constantly in love and I've always got a new person and I'm, you know, uh, or, um, like a desert island boyfriend where like they haven't <laughs> heard from me and only when there's a breakup. Like, if you hear that, pay attention. I like those. Those are good notes, though. Yeah, like it's like they're your truth mirror. Yeah, and, you know, your friends aren't completely right about anything ever, but they are not living in your experience. They have a little more distance from you to give you a little perspective. Totally. As long as you have good friends. As that's the caveat. Yeah, that's, yes, that's the You're truth. you got to find friends. the right friends. Yeah. What about, talk to us about the major obstacle that mm -hmm. happened in your life that you had to overcome. It might be repetitive. I don't mm -hmm. know if it was the time where you did call your therapist or was there another time where you were just like, this is an obstacle that I'm facing and I don't know how to get out of it. 
I mean, it's going to sound pretty general, but like getting over my childhood is the obstacle I still deal with. Um, you know, I don't have a relationship with my mom. I've, I'm sorry to hear that, but I also don't. So I understand. Yeah, well, and this so is... For, actually, you're the first person I'm, I'm admitting this to because a lot of people, perception, right? They think I do, mm. but I really don't. And this is really interesting to talk about because when you say, I don't have a relationship with my mom, here are the responses I usually hear. Like the, I'm sorry, or, oh, but it's your mom. Like, you only get one, one mom. mom. And I'm like, that's so cool for you that you can't even imagine what my experience was like to be to need this. Totally. Like, I didn't wake up and say, I don't want to have a relationship with my mom, like, out of the blue. It, she was extremely um, toxic and harassed me, and there were reasons that I had to protect myself. And so now I take it as a real sign of strength that I, you know, made a boundary about how I deserve to be treated as a human being on planet Earth. And if you cannot respect that most fundamental boundary, then I'm not here to just be um, beat up upon. Like, no thank you, even to that most fundamental relationship. And I think a lot of people, when I talk about not having a relationship with my mom, usually somebody in the room is like, oh my God, me too, and I never want to talk about it because I'm afraid everybody's going to judge me. But the thing there is like, who would judge you for you protecting yourself? Again, like, right. that's not, the person who would judge me because I don't have a relationship with my mom is also another person I don't need in my life. It was a, I needed to protect myself, mm -hmm. and I respect the fuck out of people who protect themselves. Totally. It's not something anyone does lightly. Well, you know, on that note, I feel like, again, and I'm not, I'm bringing me as an example because yeah. I could relate. I guess I felt judged to even think that way because I would mm. be told, like, mm -hmm. how could you think that? But, like, they didn't understand what I went through because right. no one will understand what you go through. I'm sure I can't even understand. I can imagine because I've gone yeah. through similar things. But what you're going through behind those closed doors or how you're feeling, yeah. like, as, in a, as a little girl, that pain. Yeah. Now and before that no one will ever get. Yeah. And I think it's a powerful thing when you decide that you're worth taking care of and you're going to do the work and you're going to protect yourself. That's fucking powerful. powerful. I mean, it's empowering. Yeah. When did you, well, did you ever feel guilty mm -hmm. growing up that you had to protect yourself? And when did you figure it out? Like, did you ever have that conversation with your mom? Like, this is not okay. I have to, because I was raised in a religious household. Mm. So a lot of it was, if you just, we're allowed to do right. anything to you because if you disrespect us, you're disrespecting God. That was Got always it. the answer. So, mm. and my, confusion about that was well if you're such a if you're such people of God I'm right. not putting my parents on in general if you're right. people of God then you would know how to treat a human being right the way you want to be treated right. that's so interesting yeah I so I guess like what I would say is I don't even I think for a parent to act the way that my parents act acted mm -hmm. they had to be in some serious pain themselves Correct. And so the first thing I'd say is I feel enormous empathy for them. Wow. And I feel I feel really grateful that my parents had me. Mm -hmm. I feel grateful. It's crazy to say now. I feel grateful for the childhood that I did have that I'm still overcoming because it made me who I am and I genuinely love who I am and I don't think I would have gotten here. I wouldn't meet you. I wouldn't be meeting incredible people who are on the same path. None of this would have happened had I not had that particular childhood. So I am ultimately grateful for it. I try not to blame my parents. They were doing the best they could. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they're, you know, in the book I go out of my way not to kind of um, pathol. I try not, I don't label them because right. I, I, I'm not here to tell their story. I don't know why it was that they acted the way they did. I know from, with my dad, for example, that I'm sure he wanted to do better mm -hmm. and that he just wasn't equipped. So for me, I have a lot of, um, I marry my gratitude to my sorrow. Yes, yeah, so and and you talk like, about that a lot in yeah. the book about practicing gratitude no yeah. matter what, right? Yeah. Can you, so of course, elaborate. And that's one of the examples is that you didn't, you knew they were coming from pain, 
you didn't understand how to appreciate it, but you did. You you should be grateful for the fortunate and unfortunate yeah. situations in life. And at the time, like when I'm a little girl, you know, trying to run away from home, that I had no fucking gratitude. I right. I, I was just upset and angry totally. and confused. But totally. later in life, through developing a gratitude practice, that's where I've learned to be grateful for 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 my parents, for better or worse. But that doesn't mean I have to have a relationship. Right. I can be grateful, and I can also have a boundary. And, you know, even I'm close with my dad, but one of the ways we became close was through the writing of the book because finally he had to kind of come to terms in a sense with my childhood because it was written and I gave him the manuscript a year before it came out. So it was the first time we ever had a conversation wow. about a lot of this. So it's been a very healing process in that respect. Um, but we often think of our parents as the most personal relationship on planet Earth. Like what could be more personal than a relationship between child and parent? Right. And it's simply not true. Right. Your parents give you the best they have to give, and they don't know any better. They're doing their best. Right. Like they're just like, like they're like us. They're yeah, living they're life. Just, they're trying. And if they went through some shit and didn't even have the self awareness to work through it, how would they have the self awareness not to put you through the exact same thing? Right. And it's not like they're just treating you that way. Yeah. I'd bet they treat. Everybody that way, including themselves, like, you know, that is a, true. a painful, like, to think about, um, and in my circumstance, I have empathy for my dad and my mom. Like, that, to raise kids in a neglectful household, they must have been neglecting themselves. Right. There's no way they were happy. Right, and that it was easy for them. That is such yeah. a great way, yeah. though, to not resent your parents yeah. and really love yourself. Yeah. That is so true that you're loving yourself by having empathy for people who put you through pain. Yeah, and just remembering, you know, nothing is personal. Basically, like, people that's get... Grown up. That's a grown-up <laughs> mentality. Hey, you're a grown-up. I need to be around you more because that's a grown-up mature mentality it's, because some of us yeah. resent and we hold on to that resentment and we're still that 16 year old kid and we can't let go I, I mean I have one friend situation in my life right now where I, I feel myself go to blame I'm like well, she did that like she did that to hurt me and I have right. to be like wait no she is acting the only way she knows how to act it has literally nothing to do with me what what I what it does have to do with is that I stuck around. Right. I am responsible for me. That I knew this was happening. I allowed it. It's not personal. She's not attacking me. But I also I didn't need to be around for as long as I was. And right. I think the quicker we can um, get on board with this idea that people are limited, nothing is personal. I love that. The better off your whole life is because you start realizing People are not out to get you. Nobody's in right. inter entertainment in particular. I think people think that people don't want you to succeed. Yeah. And they're like, no. They're banning me. They're purposely going out of their way. They don't like me. I know. You're I right. We have all that mentality. I basically promise that everybody's too busy and wrapped up in their own self story to even fucking think about you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank like, you. We need to hear Most of the time, just, like, you do, you're right. nobody is thinking about you. But do you, you know how much that helps us <laughs> yeah. get out of our own way? Yeah. Because that's a practice I want to start practicing yeah. from your book and yourself because I think that's so freeing nobody so freeing. It, the thing I write in the book is nobody cares at all in regards to everything oh, I love that. they're just not thinking about you they're not and you're right they are so self most people <laughs> are self-absorbed they're self-absorbed we're all self-absorbed we're all living in our own movie right we're just literally not thinking about other people and generally if we are it's usually something nice because if you take the time to think about someone, it's usually like, I'd like to see so-and-so or what am I doing for her birthday or um, making a plan. Like, I don't sit around all day plotting how I'm going to block people from their dreams. Even if they've done you wrong, right? Yeah, like, like, that's just not a thing I'm, like, <laughs> doing on the daily. Right. So chances <laughs> are, you. like, nobody's doing that to me. But you're right about that, and that's in the book, too, that stuck out, stuck out to me stood out to me, sorry, was 
the positive thinking. It's changing yeah. your thinking. Because a lot of times I think people come to me and say, well, Chanel, but I thought about it and it came true. Is it because we're attracting that energy maybe mm. or we're putting that energy mm -hmm. out there? Mm -hmm. how, how important is it to self-teach ourselves or parent ourselves to think differently? I mean, I think it's essential. In the book, I call it pronoia. Mm -hmm. You know, there's paranoia where you think everyone's conspiring against you. Mm -hmm. I believe in pronoia, which is that the world is secretly working for my betterment and for oh, me to wow. do well. Because in a best case scenario, that's true. In a worst case scenario, I just don't let people's little petty shit get to me because I am I can just more easily brush things off. Knowing it's not personal. Yeah, I know it's not personal. I'm, I am give people the benefit of the doubt where I can. And, it, you know, I think there's, you could think of it as like a Pollyanna, like, oh, I'm just looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. But I actually think it's a very powerful, strategic way to move towards what you want because you're not fucking stuck in the past. Totally. Worrying giving so much oxygen to anxiety and your worries of how, what other people think of me. Pronoia is an incredible tool that really blasts through a lot of our self-imposed limits. Because totally. we often build a very low roof over what we think we can achieve. And part of that roof is they're out to get me, that person doesn't want me to succeed, Whatever, like again, like mostly people are not thinking about you. That, totally. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's the, just, the the moral of the story. Yeah, though. They're not. Yeah. What do you say to the? Well, what are your tips for people who are battling anxiety, depression? Yeah. Quick tips that they can work through um, when they're at work or just during the day, yeah. and also how to. Yeah. Just how to overcome that. Yeah. Really. Well, I think it's definitely a process. So the first thing I'd say is this is something I do every day. When I'm feeling anxious or depressed or just an anxiety ball of uh, bad vibes, I put my hand on my heart and I say, it's okay, sweetheart. I find something that is self-soothing. Like in my um, when I was in my mid-20s on my... Um, computer monitor, I had a post-it note that said, everything is actually okay. It was just a reminder, like have compassion for yourself. Yeah. Have compassion and feel proud that if you're even Googling this shit, you're interested in healing yourself. And that is dope as fuck. Yeah. Like good for you, high five, hug, I'm so happy. So first, learning to cultivate some self-compassion. And then the second thing is Find one thing, anything that you'd like to work on about yourself. It could be something really small, like I'd like to have, I am, I'm exhausted every day. I'd like to have an um, earlier bedtime. Two, I have a challenging relationship with my dad. What can be done here? And do the very first step towards healing that. You know, if it's a bedtime, it's like, well, Okay, I'm banning screens past 9.30. Right. If it's something with your dad, maybe asking your friends if they've had similar situations. Maybe it's reading a book about those kinds of situations. Just start. Do Just not start. worry about... I think people get really hung up on how's it all going to work out in the end? And I'm going to have to change my life and quit my job and leave my husband and like all this shit. They're like so fast forward, right? I'm like, nobody asked you to do any <laughs> yeah, of I'm that. Die. I'm like, dead. <laughs> like nobody. Like, so stop with the why this isn't going to work out in the end and just start with like, what's the one thing right now? So that would be like my two quickest things would be one, a little bit of self-compassion and a pat on the back for even being interested mm -hmm. in your interior life. And then two is just what's the first thing that comes to mind that you want to work on and what's the very first step you can take towards working on it. That's amazing advice and tips. That's I'm going to start doing that and you guys listen out there because yeah. they're amazing. Thank you. Um, sorry, how much time do we have? Are we good for that? A couple more. Okay, good. Okay, great. Social media. Yes. Everyone's so consumed about like, Upkeeping with the Joneses. Yeah. What's your advice to, if somebody tells you, like we've been talking about this, mm -hmm. if somebody tells you, well, you're not good at comedy or you're not going to make it because you haven't put your dues or what advice should we take from you and from the mm -hmm. book as to like brush that off? 
Well, I think like fuck that. Mm -hmm. You know, like I I'm <laughs> I know. It's like, like I wish I was in your mind. I know, because it's easy I know it's easier said than done, but like how do well, I say like, you know what, fuck what that person is it, thinks. Are you is it that people on social media are saying something or is it that is it an people right on that platform or saying something or is it like comments from real people in real life both so even on the on the platform and even peers in real life that yeah. might say you know what i don't think you should be in tv or on radio or a, a producer because i don't think you're going to make it so i think that there's a difference between feedback and cruelty okay great that's and good to know feedback we can all take so i've gotten notes on everything from you know one of my biggest um uh, failings or characteristic things that I could work on is I treat everything so urgently and not everything's a fire. Things need to be prioritized. So like, why am I, and I'm trying to make my fire everybody else's fire. That's fucking annoying. Right. And something that I've gotten feedback on and while painful to hear at the time, I'm able to hear it, process it, work on it because I'd like to be a better version of myself. So that's feedback. Somebody saying to you, you can't, you shouldn't, you won't, you can't succeed, is cruel. Who made them God to right. tell you what you are and are not capable of? I don't care who they are, they, just, they simply don't know. And I think when somebody tells you something like that, they are oftentimes talking about what is true of them. They don't think they can be a comedian. They don't think they can be a producer. They don't think they've got it within them to do the thing, so how dare you try? So you've got to be like a really good listener. Like, are they saying your comedy needs more work? Like, workshop this? Right. That's legit. Like, if somebody's giving good feedback, a huge part of my job is giving feedback about scripts and, you know, it's a notes process. When we give notes, we really try to make it constructive, something you could work on and never it's not funny. Like that's a judgment. Right. Like listening for what's a judgment versus what is legit feedback. And then who's the source? If it's a random egg troll on Twitter, like why would I put any stock into that? Right. If it's my best friend who loves me very much, who's looking out for me, I probably have to listen to the bitch. Like, you know, exactly. like. Exactly. A, that's a good thing. Who's the source? Yeah. So it's is it feedback or is it a judgment and who said it and those are kinds of the things that i look at and if anybody ever tells me what i can or cannot do i will like rage vendetta go after it yeah. i have some of my sweetest successes are when someone told me i couldn't do something i was like oh yeah really i write about in the book an ex-boyfriend told me i could never get anything in the new yorker ever I wasn't a good enough writer and I wasn't an interesting enough person to be profiled, so never. Are you sure we're not twins? <laughs> I've had similar ex-boyfriend like, stuff yeah. too. Ne like I would never do anything. You're never like, going to do their pot. No one's ever going to take you seriously. Right. Like you can't. I can't believe you're even, you're too dumb to even do what you're doing. Oh, I want to punch that person. That's awful. I know. Thank you. But like. But I want to punch your ex too. For, <laughs> and, and then you did it. Well, so then six months later, I worked my ass off and got something on the New Yorker online. And when I did that. I felt like I was dancing in a field of fire on his grave. Yes. Like, that's how good the victory felt. Um, and that was one of those times where I was like, oh, you think I can't do this? I will. But what I realized was he was talking about himself. Right. He was talking it was never about, about it you. It wasn't about me. Again, people are limited. Nothing is personal. He, it wasn't that he was personally attacking me. He thought he could never write something. He thought he had no creativity in him. And he was projecting onto me his own insecurities. Wow. So, the, I mean, like, it all comes back to, like, the quicker you can get on board with people are limited, nothing is personal, the happier. I promise. I promise. I'm going to do it. I'm going to speak it to the universe and, every day. And it's, you know, for me, it was like I would write these things down in my journal, like, ten times a day. People are limited. Um, nothing is personal. Like, I did not believe any of this when I began. It really is like you, you know, you go to school, your mm -hmm. parents teach you what you're going to unlearn all this because you had one thought. Right. No. Right. Like, you have to put in into practice and really catch yourself, you know, when you get a mean piece of feedback, like, you can't do this, pause, 
pausing is always a part of it before like reacting like pause mm -hmm. allow it to exist like okay I allow that I feel really bad about this I'm not going to be mean to myself and say I shouldn't feel this way I do feel this way and then sort of nurturing like that was a mean comment I don't need to take it personally this person is limited but you really do need to like uh, you can't ignore it like I also wouldn't say just right. ignore the haters it hurts like it when hurts. something hurts let it hurt right let it hurt let it, so you can heal yeah exactly that's amazing Comedy Central we got lights out with David Spade yeah. how did that come about um what made you feel like okay this is a show that I really want to get behind well I can't speak for the network and why they you know I am like a lowly um middle manager executive um, but I think what is amazing about David Spade is he is an A-list, A-list icon of comedy. And his fans love him, and he's one of the hardest working people I've ever worked with. So I think that kind of undeniable talent, any pl I would think any place would want him on the air. And I think he's just one of the most hardworking, nicest humans you could meet. That's so cool. Like your job, did you feel like, did you pick comedy specifically? Did was, that have a lot to do with your journey? Yeah. And getting through the childhood and, and even writing the book? Like, was yeah. it something that kept you going? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've always, you know, used comedy to cope with, mm -hmm. like, since I was a kid, I was writing little plays or I've always just gravitated towards comedy. And, um, you know, it helps release tension, it helps deal with things that otherwise seem really scary and unrelatable. If you can relate to someone through a joke, it's like a gut, like, oh, we're on the same page. Like, oh, we can connect. Um, so I think it's one of the quickest ways to connect with other people. And I've always just had an affinity. I've always loved comedy. There was never a time I didn't. Why behind the scenes and not? Because you're so good on camera. <laughs> oh, thank you. Like you're amazing. It's thank incredible. You. You're such thank a natural. You. Why? Any reason why? Or I, you know, I think a lot of it had to do with my upbringing. I really wanted stability. You know, I think an, another person in my position would have turned it into a stand-up. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of stand-ups, they're working out They've got reasons they want to be on that stage. Because the, they're working through their whole mess. Yeah, it, it, it's and, like a messy life. Well, the performers, you know, what what do they get? Clap, clap. Like, literally, we validate you. Yes. And there's another world in which that would have been the road I would have gone down. But I really wanted a stable life. I wanted one where I wasn't, you know, that's a really hard life. Like, a stand-up. I have the most respect in the entire world for stand-up comedians because I do not have that bravery in me to say, I am the one on stage, judge me by literally my performance here. Right. You know, a book, I've got 350 pages for you to read. You're not judging me based off like one passage. People judge comedians off one joke all the time. You're right, right, I could read the book one chapter, one sitting, and love it. And yeah. never judge you and, tell, and say you're the funniest person in the world. And then it's like, you know, on to the next one. But a, a comedian, that is a hard, vulnerable, so I mean, I just respect the fuck out of the comedians we work with. And I feel lucky to be in their orbit that they trust me at all to help with their vision. And that's definitely the most rewarding part of my job is just to be a part of it. Right. Like to be able to help them at all. So cool. Is cool. It's yeah. It's really dope. So I, I think in a different life, maybe, but in this life, what I'm really proud to do is to be able to help give a platform, help clear the way, be a part of the cheerleading and the support network for comedians. You've also written a lot of playwrights. Mm hmm. Any favorite out of all the ones you've ever written? Of my plays? I mean, they're all amazing. Favorite. They're all, they're amazing. all my favorite. Yeah, I don't know, because my plays I haven't done in, like, it's, that was really a more, like, um, earlier in my career, mm -hmm. but I wrote one about Anna Nicole Smith that was, it was, like, an Anna Nicole Smith told as a melodrama. That's so cool. And I that one, that. I did really enjoy doing that one. We produced it in the Fringe Festival in New York, and that was a really fun 
great experience. Probably that one. I love Anna Nicole Smith. She's, I love her too. She's someone I just R. I. think P. she rests in peace, but she went through could watch some her shit. all day. And that's the thing is like she went through some shit in the beginning, even when we couldn't comprehend it. Because in 2020, it's if she was doing it now, it's more acceptable. Oh yeah. But and I was like, this woman is amazing. She has my life. And <laughs> and like I, I feel like at the time people are like, uh right. judgy. Like, judgy, judgy. And then you look back and you're like, she seemed like a very gentle soul trying her best. Yep. Yes. Trying we're trying our best. <laughs> yeah. You know? Two more questions and we'll wrap yeah. up. Yeah. What's your favorite place? So Chanel and City, we talk about like our favorite places yeah. when in New York or mm. even LA. Uh, what's your favorite place when you come here in New York? My favorite place is easily in the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art. Mm. There is the Temple of Dendor, which is, Ooh. and it, have you been to no, this? No, I'm going to go. Oh there my God, now. you have to go. They legit took an Egyptian like temple and put it in the Met and it's in this like glass part of the Met so it's like sunshine and then there's like a fake river situation with like a little like alligator statue and it's just about the most magical place on that earth. That sounds so magical. I ne I need to go there with oh, like a cup of coffee and just like it, observe. I, it's, and take it's, it in. And it's one of those things where you're like oh well New York is the greatest city on earth like where else are you go going to the Met to be in an Egyptian temple? Like, exactly. What? Yeah. That's amazing. What's your dating advice to us single women out there? Mm. How to attract the right guy? I don't know exactly. Okay. Hmm. Great question. Because the first thing that came to mind was don't settle. Okay. We don't settle for what brand of water we're going to drink. Right. So why the fuck would you settle for a dude? True. Um, and that settling doesn't work. Like if you feel lonely with somebody in the beginning, you will feel lonely with them forever. Right. You don't, it's like, you know, in a, a shoe store where they're like, oh, well, like if we stretch it and yeah. add an insert and do this thing, <laughs> then they'll fit. And it's like, no, bitch, they're never going to fit. <laughs> exactly. Like they're, nobody has ever done that. A and shoe it, hopeful. Yeah. yeah a sh shoe hopeful is never going to happen. You're right. Because my mom would always do that. And that was the biggest pet peeve. She'd be like, She's a woman from Queens. She'd be like, I'm just telling you, put the insult and just stretch it. And I'm like, so what's the point then it's at that point? It is not, first off, <laughs> they're never right. Oh, Jewish mothers. Like, it's, well, all mothers sometimes yeah, can be like yeah, that. Yeah, it's not right. So why are we doing it? Like, why are we trying to make the shoe fit? If the dude doesn't fit, he doesn't fit. That's okay. Right. That's I love fine. That. Do you ever feel like... Should we always be ourselves in front of a guy? That yes. Like, yes. I one time heard somebody say that they weren't going to be themselves until they were married. I was like, that is a recipe for disaster. Like, enjoy your life. Like, what? Right. Yeah, you should fucking be yourself. Like, your authentic self because then you're never faking anything. Totally. Faking it with a partner is just about the loneliest thing I've ever heard. If somebody is supposed to be your person and your partner and your equal and you are faking who you are, what are you doing? Totally. Why are you even with someone if and you have to find, be someone else? Right. And they'll also figure who you are yeah. when you're living together. So why not just put it out up, up, up front? I think like if my, my advice about attracting somebody is to be attracted to yourself. Like you. Like get on board with who you are right. so that you realize I don't need to fake who I am. I can just be who I am. That will attract the right person far more than faking it. Or I used to do this. I used to try to adapt my personality to whatever I thought somebody else would like. Me too. Always. It was the and it was so hard for me. And it's did it? Let me ask you this: Has it ever worked? Never. <laughs> for five work. seconds, and then yeah. it'd be like, and then they would find something. And for no me, matter what. For me, it was. Um, I had one relationship that started by me faking so much to get him to like me. Two years in, I was a crazy person. Of course. Who didn't, I didn't like me. And I realized, wait, I don't even like him. <laughs> like, why, wait, why was I spending all this energy trying to get him to like me? I don't even like him. So my overwhelming advice would be start with you, like yourself first. What small actions can you take towards loving yourself? that will attract the right person. And basically any smart dating person would 
like Nora Ephron or any of these women that I really admire, they'd all say the same thing. So like, mm -hmm. listen to the like smart women of the world and learn to approve of yourself first. Then the right person will come into your orbit. Love that. Last question. Yeah. What is your advice to make it in the entertainment industry, to be successful in the entertainment industry? It is to know the difference between doing the work and talking about the work. Because there are a lot of people who talk a big game about how they want to be a screenwriter, they want to be a TV writer, they want to be a comic, they want to be a this. Cool, 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 cool. Have you put in time? Totally. Are you doing the work towards your dream as opposed to talking about a big dream? So really do the work is the best advice. Yeah, I mean, I've, le I've legit never seen anyone like quote unquote fail who actually did the work. Right. Like that's not, so like I think it's not talked about enough like that we talk about um, fame as like, well, we, that we talk about fame as the end goal. It's not. Mm -hmm. Being good at the thing is the end goal. Like I mean that's what I want to start paying attention to more. Yeah. Is like it's not about get cuz we all feel like to be in this industry if we get famous that yeah. is the end goal, but it's not. And I can tell you that amongst the famous people, nobody is happy if they tether themselves to that fame. They're just not because it's never enough. It's never enough. It'll it's just and then it's diminishing returns cuz you're like exhausted, but you're grinding, but you feel worse. So it's not like chasing fame. Like if you're chasing fame, I don't know what to tell you. Like, it's not go to the therapy. Industry is not for, right. Because <laughs> like, there's more than just yeah. yeah there's, like it, psychologically, there's more if you're just chasing fame. Yeah. And you and I mo know that better than anyone because of the when you're when you're being raised the way yeah. like you went through or what I went through. It's you're always gonna start chasing validation, and you're exactly. never gonna have like a healthy psyche. Right. But if what you'd like is to be the best damn writer, to mm -hmm. be the best damn stand-up comedian, or just to be doing your very best, chase that. Like, ask, like, what's the craft I need? What are the tools I need? And work on that. Those people, no matter what, are successful. I don't know that they're, like, the most famous rich people in the world, but I do know that they're the ones who are typically doing the thing they wanted to do in the first place. So focus on the actual work as opposed to the trappings of the work or talking about how one day you will do the work. I love this. I love you, Tara. Oh, Where can you. we buy Buy Yourself the Fucking Lilies? You guys have to buy yourself the fucking lilies and the book and lilies for yourself when you're and reading what, a book. Whatever flower, whatever your whatever lilies flower. are. Where can, um, yeah, where can we anywhere. purchase it? You can buy the book anywhere. Books are sold. Just a light Google and awesome. you'll and you'll stumble across it in your local bookstore, the Great. independent bookstores in particular. And where can they follow you? Um, on Instagram, I'm Tara Schuster, and that's mostly where I hang out. And if they go to my website, yes. taraschuster.com, you can subscribe to my newsletter where I give one not throw up in your mouth, it's so cheesy, self-care tool every week. Love that. Make sure you follow this beautiful woman. Thank you so much for being oh, here. Thank you for having me. It's been me. such a pleasure. It. And I hope to still yeah. be in touch and collaborate. Let's do it. I'm and into you're it. You're amazing. Thank you're literally you. my hero. <laughs> like, you're a, just an amazing person. I kind. can talk to you for, literally, you've taught me so much. So oh, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Stay tuned, guys.